Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel, which is all about income oriented investing, how to generate passive income from a diversified portfolio of high yield funds to reach financial freedom as soon as possible. And in today's video, we are going to review two brand new ETFs from one of my personal favorite covered call fund managers in Canada, Harvest Portfolios Group. So we're going to check out their two brand new ETFs, TRVI, the Harvest Travel and Leisure Income ETF, and also HRIF the Harvest Diversified Equity Income ETF. So we're going to review these two ETFs. And after we're going to be speaking with the president and CEO of Harvest, Michael Kovacs, a good friend of the channel. And we're going to talk about, of course, these two new ETFs, but also the U.S. banks fiasco, uh, which recently happened in the U.S. Remember that, you know, they have HUBL. That is one of their covered call ETFs, which is all U.S. banks inside of HDIF. So I'll be asking about that ETF, whether are they going to leave it in there? Are they going to take it out? So we'll talk about that. I'll also ask him if he's going to add this new travel ETF to HDIF and HRIF to, to the all-in-ones. Uh, is there any potential dividend increase coming for these all-in-ones? And of course, we're also going to be talking about, I think you'll like this, very controversial and misunderstood topic in investing, especially income investing, return of capital or rock income so we're going to talk about that as well so stay tuned it's a great q a with michael and I, i'd like to take the time to thank harvest portfolios group for sponsoring this video and uh, being a good supporter and friend of the channel so let's get started All right, so let's start with the travel one, guys. TRVI, the Harvest Travel and Leisure Income ETF. And in case you didn't know, Harvest did launch another travel ETF. This is more of a growth style ETF. Uh, back in 2021, January in 2021, to really capture the uh, travel companies, which have taken a huge hit uh, because of uh, COVID, of course. So this is literally an income version or a covered call version uh, of TRVL. So pretty much has the exact same companies, except they use the Harvest uh, covered call strategy, which as we know, writes covered calls on up to 33% of the portfolio. The first thing that really struck out to me was the big initial target yield of 10.4% yield, guys. Very, very interesting. They're, uh, you know, they declared the first, well, I didn't, they didn't declare the first dividend, but they expect it to be 16 cents uh, per month per unit, which means if we just take 16 cents, divide, uh, multiply by 12 to get the annual of 192. If we divide it by the current stock price uh, of 1869, times 100, and you see that the yield is just over 10%. So very, very high, nice yield that we're going to get 30 companies. Let's take a look at these companies, everyone, which is very, very important for us to do. So the first thing you will see is that it's very diversified within the travel industries. It's not just hotels, it's not just the airlines, but it's everything, every sector within the travel industry, including REITs as well. So you have hotel, resorts and cruise lines, airlines, casinos and, and, and gaming, REITs, hotel and resort REITs, leisure facilities. So if you look at the companies, you will definitely recognize most of them. So Booking Holdings is basically a, a company that has all those booking websites where you book those vacations is the biggest position marriott airbnb hilton we should all know what those are big positions as well and then you have uh, vici properties delta airlines las vegas sands so you could actually see the subsector within as well in here so it's mostly u.s companies and it's what's important to understand is that it's really the big the big ones right it's the bigger uh, travel companies, which of course um, have rebounded nicely since the COVID restrictions were listed and with all the big pent up demand. So very nice, diversified within the travel industry, of course, covered call ETF with a really, really nice high yield. This is without leverage or anything, guys. So 10% plus yield right now, of course, that yield could change based on the, the stock price. The ETF just came out on April 12th, what is the management fee? It's 0.75% management fee. So the MER, you know, it's only gonna be out within a year, but my uh, assumption or my uh, prediction is that it's gonna be about or approximately about a 1% uh, MER. So really cool uh, income version of their TRVL ETF here. If you're more into income, you want a nice consistent source of high income, and I will be speaking to, to Michael of how they could pull off such high income. But as you probably already guessed, these stocks have higher volatility. They're definitely more volatile, which means it's a lot easier to generate higher 
uh, premiums, but we'll ask Michael all about that. Second ETF that they launched is HRIF, the Harvest Diversified Equity Income ETF. All this is, guys, it's very simple. It's a non-leveraged version of HDIF. That's all it is. It's the exact same ETFs in there without the leverage. So HDIF, in case you didn't know, it's one of my favorite holdings, one of my biggest positions in my personal portfolio, is Harvest All-in-One Leverage Solution. So in HDIF, you have six covered call ETFs from Harvest, uh, giving a nice over 10% yield right now. And it has grown really nicely, over 300 million now. But if you look at the portfolio, very, very well diversified. And you have Harvest, six of Harvest's most popular covered call ETFs. The technology one, healthcare brands, utilities, Canadian dividend stocks, and US bank leaders, which has taken a, a hit recently. And I will ask, we'll talk all about it with Michael Kovacs in a second. So HRIF is literally for people who love HDIF, they like the all-in-one uh, concepts and solution, but they're not that comfortable holding something with leverage. So uh, HRIF has no leverage whatsoever. It, it actually holds, if you click on portfolio, guys, it's exact same ETFs in here, exact same pretty much uh, sector breakdown, but it's going to have more or less pretty much 25% less yield than HDIF because there's, there's no leverage. So you see 10 and a half uh, percent yield here with HDIF, about 8% target yield with HRIF. So if you like, if you're an income investor, a little bit more conservative, you're not that comfortable with leverage, HRIF is a phenomenal great option now. And it's actually the first all-in-one uh, on the Canadian market, all-in-one covered call solution that is without um, any leverage whatsoever. So very interesting uh, in case you don't want that leverage. In terms of fees, so travel, we can't really know what the MER will be because it hasn't been a year. But when it comes to HRIF, I think we could figure it out because it's basically just going to be the fees, like it says in the uh, overview. You know, there's zero management fee, of course, but the ETF is going to be subject to the underlying ETF. So if we look at the underlying MERs of the six covered call ETFs inside of HDIF or in HRIF, you see the MERs here, so the healthcare one. Uh, 0.99 MER, the brand's 0.93, technology 0.98, utilities, the lowest one at 0.75, US banks 0.98, and the Canadian one at 0.71. I did the average, it's about 0 0.90, 0 0.91 MER. So that is the MER you could expect, which with, with HRIF, of course, we won't know exactly what it is after a year, but that's more or less what you could expect. Um, so now let's talk to Michael Kovacs. We'll ask him all about these two ETFs and what we have other great topics as well that we discuss. All right, everyone, very special guest today. I am joined by Michael Kovacs, president and CEO of Harvest ETFs. Michael, you're a good friend of the channel. Thanks so much for coming back uh, on. How's it going, my friend? Great. And thanks for having us. We're always uh, happy to get on and talk about what we're doing. Yeah, it's good to have you. And speaking of what you're doing, you guys just launched two new income oriented ETFs, which, you know, my channel is all about. So we're going to discuss these ETFs. Mm -hmm. Now we'll start with the uh, the travel one. So TRVI you guys just launched this a few days ago, Harvest Travel and Leisure Income ETF. And we'll also talk about HRIF the Harvest Diversified Equity Income ETF. So let's start with the travel one first. Give me a little bit about the idea or the premise uh, behind the, the creation of this covered call ETF. Sure. Well, uh, as you know, we launched the original TRVL in uh, 2021, and uh, it was very popular. It grew very quickly. Um, and it, you know, the markets, as you know, rolled over and then they come back. But uh, we were getting a lot of requests from not only clients directly, but from uh, uh, representatives, uh, investment advisors that were saying, can you build something like this with an income stream? So when we had a look at it, the, um, the actual natural yield on the fund is about probably less than 1%, but the volatility across you know, the airlines and the cruise lines and so on has been quite high. And that was allowing us to generate quite a bit of income uh, with our option writing strategy. So when we tested it and put the models together, uh, we were actually quite surprised that we could generate the high level of income we could. So we launched the fund recently and uh, just actually just two days ago. And uh, so far, still good. 
Yeah, that's the first thing I noticed. Ten percent plus target yield, and I was as I was doing research on some of those stocks. You kind of touched mm -hmm. upon it. Barely any dividend yield, right? Base mm -hmm. base yield is what you called it. So uh, what helps is actually the volatility. So uh, you know uh, now I'm sure my audience members know this. The more volatile stocks are, the richer option premiums premiums are. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, ten percent really really good. Another thing I really like about it is that it's really diversified within the travel industry, right? You got the airlines, the hotels, you got REITs. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about the stock selection or the diversification in there, because I found it was fairly well diversified. Yeah, well, as you as you're saying, you've got airlines, you've got cruise lines, which everybody knows, uh, and you've got the three top cruise lines in there, which are which basically are 80% of the world market. Uh, yeah. You've got hotel companies uh, and the hotel companies also are casino companies. Some of those are set up as REITs. So that's where you get that sort of REIT, ex REIT exposure. So you get that REIT exposure, then you've got the online uh, booking agencies and hotels and uh, you know, you're sort of diversified. And then you're also very focused uh, on the US market. And the reason for that is not only the deep option premium, but you've got some of the best companies in the world sitting in the US market. You've also got a number of travel companies in uh, Europe, uh, some in uh, um, China and uh, Japan as well, but we're very happy with the selection of companies we can get right in the United States. And it certainly provides us for what, what we need to, uh, to build that fund and pay the income. Yeah, and it's, you know, right there on the homepage, you you have it, you write that, you know, the it's the millennials, which are the earners right now, uh -huh. and retirees with or the boomers, which there's a lot of people retiring, there, there's a lot of pent up demand, there's a lot of demand for travel. And, you know, I, I'm in I'm in Panama, and I hear I talk to retirees all the time <laughs> that are going on trips. Everyone always talks about how much more expensive it is, which is obviously great for the stocks. So did you guys have that in mind? Like, are you are you kind of I'm assuming you are, are you guys bullish on this overall sector? Do you feel like there's great uh, not only income potential with the volatility, but also growth potential as well? Well, we are bullish on the sector. We always have been um, and not to get go far too back, go back too far in history. But uh, when we originally were thinking of travel, TRBL, yeah. Um, it was because the trends we saw in travel and the uh, underlying value of those stocks as a separate component were actually outperforming the S&P. And that told us that really since about the early 90s, you've seen a steady increase in the amount of travel and all the various components of travel uh, that have been occurring. So when the pandemic shows up, it beat up a lot of these companies that were down 70, 80% and travel really came to a grinding halt. So you had all this pent up demand, which we're now seeing, and the companies are coming out, their, their, uh, their prices are higher, the cost of travel is higher, the hotel costs are higher, and now they're actually rising above the 2019 cash flow levels because they've been able to hike their prices, people are paying those prices, and they're, they're going out there and traveling. So you have that pent up demand that's catching up now, but the underlying trend was always there. And that's what really got us into the area in the first place. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. I love the covered calls on it, which gives a little bit more defense. So in case, let's say, you know, I don't want to jinx it. Let's say COVID twenty comes out. At least you have those Please. covered calls where you could still always keep harvesting those rich premiums, even if the underlings mm -hmm. go down. So you know, I'm I'm always more of a pessimist at heart. That's why I, I always invest in covered call ETF. So I think this is a great idea for uh, you know investors who really want to get in on the space, but want a little bit more defense, a little bit less volatility, and of course a nice double digit yield. So uh, pretty mm -hmm. cool ETF. You guys launch a second one. So H RIF, mm -hmm. H R I F. This is the Harvest Diversified Equity Income ETF, and this is right. basically correct me if I'm wrong here a non leveraged version of H DIF, which is your very popular all in one covered mm -hmm. call solution where you pretty much have your six, some, six of your most popular covered call ETFs in one, all in one ETF plus 25% leverage. So give me the idea of why you guys decided to launch a non leveraged version. Well, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head. Uh, it is the identical fund uh, okay. as uh, HDF uh, with the six uh, underlying ETFs that are in there. 
uh, but the uh, the idea was let's take the leverage component out and we were seeing again maybe people were concerned with interest rates and that that adds to your cost of leverage and so on it adds the risk element as well uh, we were actually getting a, a number of calls from advisors uh, as opposed to uh, direct investors that were saying, look, it's hard for me to work with this fund with the, with the extra leverage or with the extra risk factor, but we'd love to have this fund as a, as a non-levered version. So basically that's what we did. We brought the fund out uh, in a non-levered version and it's you know, it just, again, it's only been out for a day or two, but it's, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of inquiries on it. And I think it's, I think it'll be, Another way to sort of get the best of harvest uh, with a non-levered version, and you still end up getting a very attractive income of eight percent. Yeah, it's still eight percent yield. Well, you could always expect about twenty-five percent less yield than H diff. But yeah. um, I've actually gotten the same questions and concerns from people, you know, because of the leverage. Even though it's only twenty-five percent leverage, it's very modest leverage with in interest yes. rates going up. The cost of the leverage does go up as well. So now you have a non-leveraged versions and a non-leveraged version, sorry. And you guys expect for both these all-in-ones to have the, you know, identical, the identical ETFs? Because I know sometimes maybe you'll, you'll add a newer ETF or you, you could replace when you have that option. Do you expect them to have the same ETFs, the same holdings, the, those two? Uh, yes, correct. So they'll always have the same underlying portfolios, which are equally weighted across uh, other are, are harvest ETFs. Okay, makes makes perfect sense. Can I, just, can I mention something? Because you talked about like the leverage and the cost of it. I mean, as interest rates went up over the last year, it did push up the cost uh, of leverage portfolios. And uh, one of my favorite investors is Warren Buffett. And he always uses a great, he has a great line. Um, uh, higher interest rates are like gravity on stocks. You know, it sort of pulls them down. And now that we seem to be, I mean, Canada, we're not, it looks like we've stopped raising rates. The U.S. Right. may be there now. Uh, if we start seeing rates tip down later into the year, I think that's going to do great things with the stock market <clears throat> and uh, for a number of equity funds out there. So at that point, your leverage portfolios may work better for you. But the idea is to have the two different options. Yeah, my whole premise is if you think long term, if you're buying it for long term, the leverage is, you know, it, it's going to end up being your friend if you're a long term investor. But, uh, yeah. you know, it, it's always good to have the option. You know, if someone just doesn't want the leverage, they're okay with a bit less yield, a bit less, they want less volatility. Now you guys have a non leveraged version, which is great. So, you know, this question's coming. So, the US banks uh, yes. taking a beating lately. And one of the six ETFs in HDIF and now in HRIF is HUBL, which is purely. U.S. banks, the biggest mm -hmm. 16 banks, you know, no small fries, the big ones there. Mm -hmm. So um, are you guys thinking like if something bad happens or one of these ETFs takes a hit, are you thinking of swapping it out? Uh, do you have any plans to do that? Are you guys still confident in the U.S. banks uh, as a sector? Tell me a little bit what you guys are thinking at Harvest about the, the recent maybe 20% drop or something like that uh, with U.S. banks overall? Well, we, we think that um, I mean, we've gone through this sort of mini crisis, if you will. And uh, one of the things about Hubble or our bank fund is that you're, you're really anchored across some of the top banks in the world. Right. So First Republic was a position. It was actually the smallest position in there. And that, that was, if anything, our only, only exposure to uh, the crisis that happened. Um, but the other banks came to the rescue very, very quickly. Uh, the Fed jumped in there very, very quickly. They didn't want this to morph into something more. Uh, the amount of leverage in banks is not even 10% of what it was back in 2008. I mean, they've really done a lot to clean up their balance sheets and, and, and change their business models. So we weren't concerned about the banking industry. But when these things happen, you don't want it to sort of catch on and get worse and worse and worse, which is why we think it's great that the Fed came in very early and why uh, the other banks stepped up to, to help out uh, some of the banks that were struggling. Now that said, uh, we look at this portfolio and if you look at the top 20 banks in the United States, most of them make up this portfolio. So yeah. very good companies yeah. in here. Um, and uh, you know, I think our, our lowest 
on that totem pole, I think it was number 24 in the United States, which has close to 5,000 banks. So uh, we feel very comfortable with it. We're not going to uh, pull it out of the portfolio. Uh, if anything, there's probably going to be an opportunity in the banks at some point uh, from the standpoint of valuations. Uh, and we'll just continue to manage it and write our options on it. Well, one thing I wanted to mention, though, even though First Republic got hit, we were actually pulling in about 11% in premium income by writing calls on that when it was getting hammered. So it did generate some additional income for us. And now we're at the point where we're, we're making a decision as to whether we're gonna just take the name out completely and replace it. But the yeah, portfolio that, or the fund itself will be remaining in the portfolio. Okay, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense to me. I always, it always gives me comfort knowing at least it's a cover cost strategy. If there's a lot of volatility, I know that if the underlines go down, like you mentioned, the premiums, must be really really rich nowadays for those u.s banks it must be even easier to generate that yield and plus like you mentioned it's not just a few banks you have all the big banks in in, in hubble and hubble is one only one of six etfs in in, mm -hmm. in the all in one so diversification cover to calls is always your friend during volatility in, in my opinion um what i've noticed um this is just a, a question for my um curiosity now mm -hmm. hubble makes up a lower percentage obviously because it went down in hdiff um, do you guys have a rebalancing plan for hdiff mm -hmm. is it every six months every year or it's ad hoc no it's every quarter every quarter okay so, so we will be rebalancing that uh, position okay. back to to its uh, original re uh, equal weight position okay correct which, me if which, i'm wrong which, if... sort of, which sort of plays into your uh you buy when stocks are down and if you look at that sector is down. So to allocate more capital to it, after we've cleaned up that portfolio, allocate more capital to it. Maybe that actually adds more upside to that portfolio down the road. That's exactly what I was right. going to ask you. Rebalancing technically means if you're if it's at 17%, you got to bring up you're buying more of those banks when they're right? down, which means you're capitalizing on the the opportunity. I I, I like the concept of rebalancing. Because uh, it kind of is almost in a certain way dollar cost averaging, right? Every every quarter, Correct. something like that. Okay. Yeah. Glad I cleared that up. Thanks so much for that. So, of course, you know this question is also coming. You got the new travel uh, cover call ETF, which has a very attractive yield. Uh, is this going to be added to the all-in-ones, the HDIF or the HRIF? I know you can't really tell me about the changes upcoming, but what can you tell me about, you know, the covered call ETFs that are not currently in the all-in-one? How do you decide whether to add one, when to add one, to remove one, swap one out? Very curious about that. Well, it, you're well. You're right. We're, even if we were planning, we couldn't tell you because it, it's um, non-public information. But what happens is when we look at that portfolio, uh, it actually meets the criteria. It's large cap names. It's mainly consumer discretionary, consumer product companies, uh, great income. It would meet the criteria to fall into uh, HDIF and HRF. Uh, but for me to sort of lay out that, if it's going to happen or what the timing is, I'm not at that sort of ability to do that right now. No, but I it totally doesn't meet the criteria. It does meet the criteria. Okay, it does meet the criteria. Well, I could, you know, hopefully I, I'm speaking for my my large income audience. I think for right. me, it would be an awesome idea. I'm just, just saying, just saying. Yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, last question, I guess, hypothetically speaking, let, let's stick with hypotheticals here. Let's say you do add the travel one or a, another one, like like the, the REIT one, HGR, and the mm -hmm. yield goes up. Would that mean technically a possible dividend increase for HRIF or HDIF if you do that, if, if, if the yields go up? Uh, well, if, if we are generating consistently high yields, yes, that means the yield could go up. And as you know, some of our other ETFs, we've, we've moved the yield up sometimes a couple of times, we've moved yields higher. It's really, can the portfolio sustain the higher yield for the longer term? And if yeah. we sort of go through our testing and we believe it can, uh, over say a three to six month period, we would increase the yield. But again, we have to get there to, to make that decision. Awesome. A lot of yields are up now because stock prices have come down so much and sort of the yields have moved in sympathy the other way. Eventually we will probably see that, you know, even out again, but um, 
I mean, there was a time when an 8% yield was a great yield. Now, you know, everyone wants double digits. So <laughs> everyone wants, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly want double digits. I've been snatching up HDIF, honestly, personally, in the last uh, last couple of months because of the, the, the U.S. banks. And, you know, HDIF has passed 10% yield. I think it still is in double digits. So yeah. great opportunity. L l final question, because I, I know you, you, you guys probably get this all the time. The sustainability and safety of these high yields now when it comes mm -hmm. to the covered call etf it, it, it's a completely different story if you talk mm -hmm. to a classic investor they 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 don't really know about covered call writing and the amount of high yields it could generate they just think about dividend yields mm -hmm. which you know hdif i think my estimate is that maybe 70 percent plus of that yield is actually the covered call writing and only 30 percent mm -hmm. or less is the actual dividend so what would you say to investors who are skeptical about these high yield covered call funds about the sustainability of these yields well i think they're very sustainable when you launch a fund like for example we launch most of our funds we launch uh, other than travel right now the trvi that's that's a higher yield but most of them are launched uh on a portfolio that can generate a yield a natural yield from the uh the stocks the dividends and then the option writing of sort of in that seven to eight percent range, as I've said, we've seen such a fall uh, in the price of these stocks that the yields have gone up. Like think about the banks; the yields are up quite a bit on the banks. Uh, that helps to push that yield up, so it moves the sympathy. But we want to make sure that when we're writing, when we're testing these portfolios ahead of time, we're making sure that we can maintain and sustain that yield one year out. So it's always a one year out. Um, uh, sort of mapping, if you will, and testing that we do uh, when we go into each year. So when we started 2022, we set our yields, we go into 2023, we set our yields to the consumer, they may not see any difference because the yield never changes, but we're always going through that and reviewing that and making sure that we can meet that yield criteria. And, and I, maybe on another interview, uh, I think I said to you, we actually get right down to the month by month. So we see what's our yield coming in, what other interest dividends have we got? Mm -hmm. How much do we need to write? Do we need to write overall 28%? Do we need to write 23? Maybe we need to write at 33, but we will make that decision on an ongoing basis so that we are generating enough capital to generate that yield. Yeah. The other thing that's confusing, if I could jump on there is, and we get the call all the time, someone will look at your tax factors, they'll say, hey, you paid out 80% ROC return on capital. Are you, are you grinding or are you encroaching on capital? And the answer is no, we're not, because a great example is our HTA. Uh, if you look at the portfolio last year, it shows a 100% return on capital. If you look at it the year before, it was almost 100% capital gains. So it really depends on how much yield you bring in, how much uh, expenses and uh, costs from previous years you can carry forward to offset income. That is, and, and when you offset income, it's actually from a tax standpoint, treat it as a return of capital. Right. When people see return of capital and they think, oh, you're encroaching on my capital, but it's not an encroachment. It's actually, we're paying out capital that we're bringing in, but it's the tax status of that capital. So yeah. every month we're making sure the dividends, the options we're writing, any other income into the portfolio can generate that yield. At the end of the year, that's when the finance people and the accounting people sort of say they start measuring how much is expenses, how much is capital gains, how much of it was dividends and so on to make up that overall portion of uh, the different portions of what that yield is from the standpoint of a tax perspective. If you're inside an RSP or a RIP, it's all a wash anyhow. Yeah, it's really more nice. outside of an RSP. If you're inside an RSP, then you should just be looking at your total capital return. And that's at the end of the day, how much income did I generate? How much did the fund move up or down? What's my net return? I can't tell you how happy I am that you discussed this because it's also one wow. of the most common questions I get. Yeah. Rock, they Google rock right away. They see the technical definition. It's your, they think it's it's just a scam. It's your money coming back to you. But I actually have two rock videos where I really go in depth and analyze. Rock is just a tax classification. Funds could use prior mm -hmm. losses to offset Correct. the options yeah. income, which is capital gains. That's what people need, need to understand when you're doing covered calls, that's capital gains income. So if a fund has losses, 
like for example hta you mentioned hta which is technology cover call etf technology we all know took a, a big beating in 2022 so there's there's capital losses in the fund so all those nice premiums those capital gains get offset and it turns it into rock it doesn't mean it's an encroachment of capital or grinding like you said right. it's it's just there instead of you don't have to pay taxes on it it's it's i call rock delayed capital mm-hmm. gains because it does lower your cost base but i'm, I'm happy yeah. you, uh, you you we, you talked about this and for my audience now in case uh, you don't know this uh and michael you could confirm this you guys will never go over 33 percent coverage when it comes to Correct. the cover calls which means that only one third of the portfolio has calls on it and mm-hmm. the rest just goes up with the stock market and it's a dynamic approach and you guys typically do out of the money also, right? Yeah, we're usually at or out of the money slightly. You see, okay. when you write closer to at the money, your premiums are higher because that's your higher level of, of speculation. You get into all your, your sort of different dynamics of option writing and when you add in how much time value you've got, how much premium value you've got based on if it's out the money or in the money or out of the money. So all these things sort of play into it. But we try to stay very close, like within two or three percent of the uh, of the call price. Yeah, makes sense. So yeah, it's not a very it's not a super aggressive cover to call strategy, if you ask me. Just a third, and that's max. It doesn't mean you're writing a third. You're up to a third only. Right. Um, and I'll point out the fact that you guys have even increased two dividends on two two ETFs, the brands one and the technology one because of those rich premiums so uh a very very stable monthly distributions which is what you guys are known for really to have those stable distributions so michael it's yeah. always a pleasure having you i hope you come back again and k- keep launching these great new products we're all we're all looking forward to them and uh yeah it was nice speaking to you take care well thank you take care Hey, don't go yet. I have some important reminders, including some more recent ones, and I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. And for everything that I'm about to discuss, the links and and info are in the video description below. So first of all, if you didn't know yet, I do offer a one-on-one coaching session where you'll have a one-hour Zoom call with me where you could ask me all the questions you want, and I'll help you and assist you best I can. Just remember that I'm not, not a licensed or registered financial advisor or planner. So to book a session, go on my website, passiveincomeinvesting.ca, and Right there on the homepage on the left-hand side, there is a small video. Watch that video to know how to book a one-on-one properly with yours truly. Also on my website, you could purchase my digital product, the Ultimate DIY Investing Package, which is on version four right now. It comes with lifetime updates, so you only have to buy it once. And this is really a reference tool or a companion tool to help you build your own portfolio according to your needs and your objectives. It has a list of funds. It has sample portfolios for both Canadian investors Investors and American investors. So make sure to check it out uh, on my website. I actually created a video which uh, shows the product from A to Z because I don't want you to spend money unless you know exactly what you're getting. So make sure to check that video out on my website. And don't take my word for how good it is. Check out the reviews. There's over 300 of them and they are all 100% real reviews. So here's some more um, updated news or recent news. I am now on Blossom, a new investing app designed for investors. I've been using it for a few weeks now. I think it's really, really great it has a really cool feature where users could actually add and share their portfolios and what they're buying and selling every day so you could actually link your investing account so it's updated automatically on a daily basis i recently added my own main portfolio so you could follow how my portfolio is doing live and what i buy every month really really cool It's like a mix of Facebook and Twitter, but specifically for investing. So get on your phone, click on the link in the video description below and download the app. It's 100% free. So you two could share your portfolio. Just remember to look for me and follow me. My username is Adrian PII altogether. Also, I do have a referral link for Quest Trade. So you could get $50 worth of free stock purchases. This is the Canadian discount broker that I use and I recommend. Unlike Wealthsimple, the other popular discount broker in Canada. You uh, you could drip everything you want. It has all the stocks and it also has dual currency accounts. Very, very uh, convenient if you're buying both Canadian stocks and American stocks. 
I have a Quest Trade video, by the way, which shows gives you a little tour uh, of the fe features. So make sure to check that out. I also have a referral link for Passive. This is the portfolio tracking tool that I use to consolidate all our accounts to get a nice bird's eye view. So we can cons for, you know consolidate all the inf information together for easy tracking and stats as well. Also, our Facebook group. Passive Income Investing is now an invite-only private group. So to join it, you need to click, click on, the, on the link in the video description below and give the group a like to get invited. So we take pride in making this one of the best investing Facebook groups out there with over 13,000 members. There's no scams, there's no spammers, and the negative and doomsday people we kick them out right away. Also, follow us on Instagram if you want a little bit more of our personal journey here in Panama. And lastly, just remember everyone, I am not a licensed or registered financial advisor. This channel is all about my personal investing journey and how I invest to generate high passive income from a diversified portfolio of high yield funds. It's for educational purposes only, so don't forget to do your own research and due diligence. And of course, stay safe everyone, stay healthy, and of course, stay passive. See you next time.